All new at 10, scientists say it's a matter of when, not if, there will be a major earthquake in the new magic seismic zone. It is a matter of when, not if, another earthquake will hit the New Madrid seismic zone, centered around 160 miles south of St. Louis, according to scientists. Unknown to many, a massive force lies dormant, hidden from the naked view. The New Madrid seismic zone holds stories of past destruction and everything hints at the potential of another one, with everyone going about their life unbothered. Could we be close to experiencing another ground shake like the one experienced in the 1800s? Is there a way to beat it? Join us as we dive into the story of what just emerged at New Madrid terrifies the whole world. The Mystery of the 1811 Earthquake On the 16th of December, 1811, the United States experienced a strange event when the Earth started shaking hard. Tremors in Asheville, North Carolina woke many people up, and although there was no major death or damage, it was scary for residents who had never before experienced an earthquake. A few days after that, there was widespread news of this similar event. Stories appeared in papers far and wide, from Charleston in the south to Washington, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and New York in the north, covering distances as far as the UK to Greece. Almost the entire country felt the quakes. The shaking did not stop there. It kept on occurring over the next two months until February of the following year. People were desperate to find out where these shakes were coming from. But back then, messages took a long time to spread. As news slowly reached the big East Coast cities from inland, it became clear that the closer to the West the news came from, the scarier it was. Reports from the Mississippi Valley in the New Louisiana were the scariest. The winter of 1811 and 1812 saw the most frightening and intense earthquake series in the United States. There were over 2,000 quakes, with some reaching magnitudes of seven more. These were the strongest quakes ever recorded in the contiguous United States, happening not along the West Coast, but right in the middle near New Madrid. The quakes caused extensive changes to the region's topography, subsidence, uplift, Fissures, landslides, and riverbank collapses were common. Trees were uprooted by the intense shaking. People drowned when subsided land flooded. Real Foot Lake was formed in Tennessee by subsidence of 1.5 meters to 6 meters in some places. Lake St. Francis in eastern Arkansas was expanded by subsidence, with sand and coal being ejected from fissures in the adjacent swamps as water levels rose by 8 to 9 meters. Waves on the Mississippi River caused boats to wash ashore. Riverbanks rose, sand bars were destroyed, and some islands completely disappeared. Sand blows occurred in Missouri, Tennessee, and Arkansas covering farmland. The continuous underlying rock mass, uninterrupted by fractures or faults, conducted the seismic waves from the earthquakes over great distances, with perceptible ground shaking as far away as Canada. Intense effects were widely felt in Illinois, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Missouri. The number of people who died is unknown. As a frontier area, the region was sparsely populated and communications and records were poor. The predominantly wooden buildings resisted collapse, though the intense shaking caused many chimneys to fall, wood structures to crack, and trees to fall on buildings, particularly in the epicentral area during the first earthquake on December 16, 1811. Rated at 7 on the Mercalli Intensity Scale, the New Madrid earthquakes remain the strongest recorded North American earthquakes east of the Rocky Mountains. The earthquakes strengthened the Shawnee prophet Tenskwatawa after the defeat at the Battle of Tippecanoe and the destruction of Prophetstown, with local Native Americans seeing it as a vindication of his teachings. The underlying cause of the earthquakes is not well understood but modern faulting seems to be related to an ancient geologic feature buried under the Mississippi River alluvial plain, known as the Real Foot Rift. Looking at North America's strongest recent quakes map, they all occurred along the West Coast, and this is not random. Earthquakes are usually caused by tectonic plates. The huge earth plates bend and stress builds up over time. Eventually, when the stress is too much, the rock breaks and the plates snap back releasing all the stress at once, suddenly and powerfully in the areas where the Earth's surface undergoes the most significant changes known as the plate boundaries and boundary zones. 
The land shifts as the massive plates that make up the Earth's crust collide. On the other hand, the central parts of these plates usually stay stable and unchanging in the United States. These shifting zones are found along the West Coast, which is why most of the country's earthquake takes place there. Looking back to the 19th and 20th centuries, we notice that strong earthquakes can also strike within the heart of the North American plate, far from the edge where the plates meet. Whilst these internal plate quakes do occur, they are less common. However, understanding these unusual events is crucial to not only the safety of the people living in these areas, but also because they challenge our standard theories about why earthquakes happen. This has led geologists to spend a considerable amount of time and effort over the last few decades studying places like New Madrid. They want to know whether the seismic events occurring there were simply rare occurrences, or if they were something that would happen with a regular frequency similar to earthquakes at plate boundaries. Since more detailed studies began to emerge in the 1980s and 1990s, there has been a constant detection of activity in New Madrid, with many small earthquakes recorded each year. Whilst these tremors may not be felt all the time, they are an indication that there is ongoing underground movement. This phenomenon is not unique to just New Madrid, although it is the most active and studied area. Other locations within the interior of the North American plates also show signs of seismic activity. If history is to serve as a guide, these areas could also generate earthquakes similar in power to those occurring along plate edges. For example, in 2011, a 5.8 magnitude earthquake impacted the Virginia seismic area, causing significant financial damage. Also in 1886, a 7.3 magnitude earthquake devastated Charleston, causing many deaths and widespread destruction. So what exactly is it about New Madrid that sets it apart? And why are its plate boundaries so different from that of others? The History of New Madrid The first more or less permanent settlement at present-day New Madrid was established by bands of Shawnee, Delaware, Creek, and Cherokee who were turned into refugees due to the U.S. War for Independence. These refugee Native American bands accepted Spanish offers to settle on the west bank of the Mississippi River in the early 1780s. These mixed Native American groups established a settlement and informal trading post where a northward horseshoe bend of the Mississippi met the Chepusoff Creek, which provided an easy place for landing boats. Native American hunters and European American merchants made the settlement a location for processing the bounty of hunts, including the valuable but messy fat of bears and buffalo, which was used in preparing skins and furs. The settlement quickly acquired the name Lens à la Grèce, Cove of Greece or Greasy Cove. European Americans renamed the settlement New Madrid around 1780 under the auspices of Spanish governor Bernardo de Galvez, who was appointed to rule Spanish Louisiana, the land west of the Mississippi River, and Manuel Perez, lieutenant governor of Upper Louisiana in St. Louis. Gises. They welcomed settlers from the United States, but required them to become subjects, that is, swear allegiance to the Spanish crown. In addition, they had to agree to live under the guidance of his appointed impresario, Colonel George Morgan, an American Revolutionary War veteran from New Jersey. Morgan recruited several American families to settle at New Madrid, attracting a few hundred people to the region. Settlement in the 1790s and early 1800s remained relatively low due to the physical geography of New Madrid and its hinterlands. The Mississippi frequently washed away the town's riverbanks, and a Spanish fort was washed away. Surrounded by low, swampy land, New Madrid developed a well-earned reputation for diseases, especially in the summer and fall. Spanish census data from the late 1790s show around 800 residents in the village of New Madrid. New Madrid continued to operate as a site of exchange between Native Americans in the St. Francis River Valley and European-American traders operating out of New Madrid. In 1800, Spain traded the territory back to France in the Third Treaty of San Ildefonso. After trying to regain control of Saint-Domingue, the present Haiti, where a slave rebellion was underway, Napoleon gave up on his North American colonies, agreeing to sell this territory to the United States in 1803 as part of the Louisiana Purchase. The area is noted as the site of a series of more than 1,000 earthquakes in 1811 and 1812, ranging up to approximately magnitude 8 
the most powerful non-subduction zone earthquake ever recorded in the United States. New Madrid lies far from any plate boundaries, but it is on the New Madrid seismic zone. The major earthquake was felt as far away as the East Coast. During the Civil War, the Battle of Island No. 10 took place on the Mississippi River near New Madrid. In the antebellum period, this fertile floodplain area was developed for cotton plantations, based on the labor of enslaved African Americans. They were emancipated after the Civil War and worked to make new lives. As whites struggled to re-establish dominance after the Reconstruction era, they intimidated and attacked blacks under the guise of Jim Crow laws, working to suppress voting and control their activities. Three African-American men are documented as being lynched by whites in New Madrid, the county seat, near the turn of the century. Unknown Negro on November 29, 1898. Lewis Wright, a musician in a minstrel show accused of altercations with whites, hanged on February 17, 1902. And Unknown Negro, May 30, 1910. By the turn of the 20th century, some industry was being developed in New Madrid, which contained two lumber mills, a grist mill, a stave and heading factory, and a cotton gin. It was considered a rough town. There were four Protestant churches, two with independent African-American congregations, and one Catholic church, the earthquake of New Madrid. New Madrid was nearly wiped out by a series of devastating earthquakes, which also destroyed emerging settlements along the Mississippi. Now. Let us explore the first-hand experience of those who experienced the earthquakes, providing a glimpse into the terrifying experience. One such account comes from William Pierce, who was navigating the Ohio and Mississippi rivers with a group of flatboats. In a letter that he penned to the editor of the New York Post, it read thus, Proceeding on a tour from Pittsburgh to New Orleans, I entered the Mississippi, when it receives the waters of the Ohio, on Friday the 13th day of this month, and the 15th in the evening landed on the left bank of this river, about 116 miles from the mouth of the Ohio. The night was extremely dark and cloudy. Not a star appeared in the heavens, and there was every appearance of a severe rain. For the three last days, indeed, the sky had been continually overcast, and the weather unusually thick and hazy. Precisely at 2 a.m. in the morning, the 16th instant, we were all alarmed by the violent and convulsive agitation of the boats, accompanied by a noise similar to that which would have been produced by running over a sandbar. Every man was immediately roused and rushed upon deck. We were first of opinion that the Indians, studious of some mischief, had loosened our cables, and thus situated we were foundering. Upon examination, however, we discovered we were yet safely and securely moored. The idea of an earthquake then suggested itself to my mind, and this idea was confirmed by a second shock and two others in immediate succession. These continued for the space of eight minutes. So complete and general had been the convulsion that a tremendous motion was communicated to the very leaves on the surface of the earth. A few yards from the spot where we lay, the body of a large oak was snapped in two, and the falling part precipitated to the margin of the river. The trees in the forest shook like rushes. The alarming clattering of their branches may be compared to the effect which would be produced by a severe wind passing through a large canebrake. Exposed to a most unpleasant alternative, we were compelled to remain where we were for the night, or subject ourselves to imminent hazard in navigating through the innumerable obstructions in the river. Considering the danger of running twofold, we concluded to remain. At the dawn of day, I went on shore to examine the effects of the shocks. The earth about twenty feet from the water edge was deeply cracked, but no visible injury of the moment had been sustained. Fearing, however, to remain longer where we were, it was thought much advisable to leave our landing as expeditiously as possible. This was immediately done. At a few rods distance from the shore, we experienced a fifth shock, more severe than either of the preceding. I had expected this from the lowering appearance of the weather. It was indeed most providential that we had started, for such was the strength of this last shock that the bank to which we were, but a few moments since attached, was rent and fell into the river, whilst the trees rushed from the forests, precipitating themselves into the water with a force sufficient to have dashed us into a thousand atoms. John Bradbury, 
a fellow of the Linnean Society, was on the Mississippi on the night of December 15, 1811, and describes the tremors in great detail in his travels in the interior of America in the years 1809, 1810, and 1811, published in 1817. After supper we went to sleep as usual, about 10 o'clock, and in the night I was awakened by the most tremendous noise, accompanied by an agitation of the boat so violent that it appeared in danger of upsetting. I could distinctly see the river as if agitated by a storm, and although the noise was inconceivably loud and terrific, I could distinctly hear the crash of falling trees and the screaming of the wildfowl on the river, but found that the boat was still safe at her moorings. By the time we could get to our fire, which was on a large flag in the stern of the boat, the shock had ceased. But immediately the perpendicular banks, both above and below us, began to fall into the river in such vast masses as nearly to sink our boat by the swell they occasioned. At daylight, we had counted 27 shocks. From this horrifying account alone, one can only imagine how difficult an experience it was for those who had to live through it. The Mississippi Catastrophe the experiences of those at the December 16th catastrophe merely echoed the experiences of many in the northern Mississippi Valley at the time. The town of New Madrid was destroyed. In St. Louis, Missouri, many houses were severely damaged and their chimneys were toppled. This shock was definitively attributed to the real foot fault by Johnston and Schweig. Uplift along a segment of this reverse fault created temporary waterfalls on the Mississippi at Kentucky Bend, created waves that propagated upstream and caused the formation of Real Foot Lake by obstructing streams in what is now Lake County, Tennessee. New Madrid is not the only location in the United States to experience powerful earthquakes. The people of Alaska have also been victims of this natural disaster. The 1964 Alaskan Earthquake Lasting 4 minutes and 38 seconds, the magnitude 9.2 megathrust earthquake remains the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in North America, and the second most powerful earthquake ever recorded in the world since modern seismography began in 1900. 600 miles of fault ruptured at once and moved up to 60 feet, releasing about 500 years of stress buildup. Soil liquefaction, fissures, landslides, and other ground failures caused major structural damage in several communities and much property damage. Anchorage sustained great destruction or damage to many inadequately earthquake-engineered houses, buildings, and infrastructure, paved streets, sidewalks, water and sewer mains, electrical systems, and other man-made equipment, particularly in the several landslide zones along Nick Arm. 200 miles southwest, some areas near Kodiak were permanently raised by 30 feet. Southeast of Anchorage, areas around the head of Turnagain Arm near Girdwood and Portage dropped as much as 8 feet, 2.4 m, requiring reconstruction and fill to raise the Seward Highway above the new high tide mark. In Prince William Sound, Port Valdez suffered a massive underwater landslide, resulting in the deaths of 32 people between the collapse of the Valdez City Harbor and docks and inside the ship that was docked there at the time. Nearby, a 27-foot tsunami destroyed the village of Chenega, killing 23 of the 68 people who lived there. Survivors outran the wave, climbing to high ground. Post-quake tsunamis severely affected Whittier, Seward, Kodiak, and other Alaskan communities, as well as people and property in British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California. Tsunamis also caused damage in Hawaii and Japan. Evidence of motion directly related to the earthquake was also reported from Florida and Texas. Most coastal towns in the Prince William Sound, Kenai Peninsula, and Kodiak Island areas, especially the major ports of Seward, Whittier, and Kodiak, were heavily damaged by a combination of seismic activity, subsidence, post-quake tsunamis, and or earthquake-caused fires. Valdez, with 32 dead, was not destroyed, but after three years, the town relocated to higher ground four miles west of its original site. Some Alaska native villages, including Chenega and Afognak, were destroyed or damaged. The earthquake caused the ballistic missile detection radar of Clear Air Force Station to go offline for six minutes, the only unscheduled interruption in its operational history. Near Cordova, the million-dollar bridge crossing the Copper River also suffered damage, with spans slipping off its pylon and collapsing. 
The community of Girdwood was also confined to the southern side of the Seward Highway when water rushed into Turnigan Arm and flooded or destroyed any buildings left standing to the north of the highway. Only the ground immediately along the highway and that on the north side of the road dropped, prompting geologists to speculate that Girdwood may rest upon an ancient cliff face covered by thousands of years of sediment and glacial deposits. There were hundreds of aftershocks in the first weeks following the main shock. In the first day alone, 11 major aftershocks were recorded with a magnitude greater than 6.0. Nine more struck over the next three weeks. In all, Thousands of aftershocks occurred in the months following the quake, and smaller aftershocks continued to strike the region for more than a year. Alaska had never experienced a major disaster in a highly populated area before, and had very limited resources for dealing with the effects of such an event. In Anchorage, at the urging of geologist Lydia Selcraig, the city of Anchorage and the Alaska State Housing Authority appointed a team of 40 scientists including geologists, soil scientists, and engineers, to assess the damage done by the earthquake to the city. The team, called the Engineering and Geological Evaluation Group, was headed by Dr. Ruth A. M. Schmidt, a geology professor at the University of Alaska Anchorage. The team of scientists came into conflict with local developers and downtown business owners who wanted to immediately rebuild. The scientists wanted to identify future dangers to ensure that the rebuilt infrastructure would be safe. The team produced a report on May 8, 1964, just a little more than a month after the earthquake. The United States military, which has a large active presence in Alaska, also stepped in to assist within moments of the end of the quake. The U.S. Army rapidly re-established communications with the lower 48 states, deployed troops to assist the citizens of Anchorage, and dispatched a convoy to Valdez. On the advice of military and civilian leaders, President Lyndon B. Johnson declared all of Alaska a major disaster area the day after the quake. The U.S. Navy and U.S. Coast Guard deployed ships to isolated coastal communities to assist with immediate needs. Bad weather and poor visibility hampered air rescue and observation efforts the day after the quake. But on Sunday the 29th, the situation improved, and rescue helicopters and observation aircraft were deployed. A military airlift immediately began shipping relief supplies to Alaska, eventually delivering 2,570,000 pounds of food and other supplies. Broadcast journalist Jeannie Chance assisted in recovery and relief efforts, staying on the airwaves over Anchorage for more than 24 continuous hours as the voice of calm from her temporary post within the Anchorage Public Safety Building. She was effectively designated as the public safety officer by the city's police chief. Chance provided breaking news of the catastrophic events that continued to develop following the magnitude 9.2 earthquake, and she served as the voice of the public safety office, coordinating response efforts, connecting available resources to needs around the community, disseminating information about shelters and preparing food rations, passing messages of well-being between loved ones and helping to reunite families. In the longer term, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers led the effort to rebuild roads, clear debris, and establish new town sites for communities that had been destroyed for $110 million. The West Coast and Alaska Tsunami Warning Center was formed as a direct response to the disaster. Federal disaster relief funds paid for reconstruction, as well as financially supporting the devastated infrastructure of Alaska's government, spending hundreds of millions of dollars that helped keep Alaska financially solvent until the discovery of massive oil deposits at Prudhoe Bay. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and check out another of our interesting videos.